aren't we agreeing with Bart Ehrman's book, How Jesus Became God, as we are talking about this kind of evolution of the understanding of Jesus. Maybe explain his book and what he's teaching there. Yeah. Um, did I? You want to start that? Yeah. So Bart Ehrman came out with a book not too long ago, I think maybe a year ago, and it's called How Jesus Became God. And he traces... And Bart Ehrman is who? Bart Ehrman is probably North America's most well-known skeptic. Started as a fundamentalist, went to Moody Bible College, um, and then I forget which seminary, um, and today has come out and said... You pointed yourself when it started as a fundamentalist. Oh, did I? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I started as a fundamentalist too. Maybe we're on the tra- same trajectory. That's kind of scary. Yeah. Uh, anyway, I'm, I'm not where he's Baby at. Baby steps, brother. Baby steps. Oh, man. I'm not where he's at. But he's come to the position now he, where he would say he's an agnostic leaning towards atheism. Absolutely wouldn't make a confession of Jesus' duty. He would still identify as an agnostic. Say, well, you know, there's some things we don't know. I'm not going to absolutely assert that there's no God. Uh, but he would strongly assert that if there's a God, Jesus wasn't him. <laughs> and he'll make that statement pretty strongly. So in this book... He traces some of the same things that we're talking about, and he shows how there's some development and how John makes these I am statements that the earlier gospel writers don't make. He points to his favorite thing, which is later scribes come along, 100 years later, 200 years later, and they take texts that seem difficult and maybe suggest that Jesus might not fully be God. You know, he bleeds, he sweats, he sleeps. Times where Jesus asks questions like, well, what is your name? Well, what happened? Times where Mark will come along and say... Uh, Jesus tried to go into this city but wasn't able to. And there's scribes that come along 100 years later and take those things out of their manuscripts. And so he says, see what happened? Can't you tell what happened? Nobody originally thought Jesus was God. Somebody later, pretending to be John, wrote. He was a little more convinced. Then all the scribes later, they were a little more convinced, so they kind of changed some things and worked some things around. And there's this clear evidence of development. So we can say for sure Jesus didn't originally claim to be God, and nobody in his lifetime thought he was God, and in fact, nobody fully thought he was God for a full 150 years. That's the thesis he's presenting. He presents it like it's his own. He presents it like he made it up. He didn't. It started with a guy by the name of Fernanda and Christian Bauer over, what, 200 years ago. And he came up with a really similar idea based on just Peter and Paul and how there were some differences that maybe all of that was invented later. They're both working from this idea that if there's development, then can't we say that Christianity didn't really start with Jesus? And it's it's a good thought. It is. It's a good problem. It's one of the most common positions for an agnostic or an atheist to take today if they say, well, why do you reject the Christian faith? Well, here it is, development. But I would say even exactly what you said earlier, Development in our understanding of who God is doesn't mean that the person that we're talking about has changed and doesn't mean that he didn't exist in the first century and doesn't mean that the people in the first century weren't acknowledging that he was God. Does Matthew shave off some rough edges? Yeah. Does John come along and make things a little more explicit? Yeah. Does Nicaea come out and make things way more explicit? Yeah. But that's not the same thing as saying that when the New Testament authors wrote, they didn't believe Jesus was God. They did. In other words, a fuller articulation of a position. The fact that you make a fuller articulation of a position doesn't mean that you didn't previously hold the position. Does that make sense? And that, that'd be a real brief answer to a really long argument. Yeah, I would, I would say to that, uh, uh, is it, what's the difference in us taking the movement of Bar Ehrman? The biggest difference is the confession of who Christ is and what he did. I mean, we're going to have lots of different ways of putting this puzzle piece together or these pieces of the puzzle together on the outsides and on the bottom half and the top half. But when we get to the center and get to Jesus Christ, you know, we all put him together the same way. Um, The difference of Bart Erdman and what he does does is he rejects the resurrection of Jesus. And um, all we're doing is looking at the Bible and saying, let's take the Bible seriously. You can understand the stuff that started with Bauer at Tübingen University in Germany. Germany always gets the bad rap for everything. <laughs> they get the bad rap for the birth of liberal theology with, with Friedrich Schleiermacher and many of those guys. But um, you have uh, this birth of, of people who say, I want to study the Bible without tradition as my guide. 
I want to do it on my own. I want to take it seriously. I want to take each book seriously. I want to say, what did John believe? What did Mark believe? What did Paul believe? Which books did Paul write? Did Mark really write Mark? Well, nobody had really considered these things in a long, long time in a critical way. And so one of our critical scholars out of the liberal uh, side of things came out and started doing this. People became very uncomfortable. It's like, what are they questioning? They can't question these things. These things are established. But the problem is, you've got to ask yourself, is it established by who? How do you know that the ones that have gone before you, the people that have gone before you, are correct? Just because they're, they're breaking up your puzzle as you have been handed it, and wanting to put it back together, and wanting you to put it back together on your own, uh, that, that, is, that is the very essence of the Protestant Reformation. Protestant Reformation said, Semper Reformanda. We have not only reformed the church, but we are to always reform. We have not only broken it all apart and put it back together, but you better be doing that every generation, and every family better be doing that, and every individual better be doing that. You need to be able to put the puzzle together, but at the same time, we never do it on our own. Even those guys at Tübingen have never done it on their own. They're always relying upon people that rely upon other people, other scholars, other studies. It's just whether the people you're leaning on are trustworthy. A lot of these people I lean on, I trust them in many areas. I don't have people hung on the wall that I trust some, but really weren't that great of scholars. Um, That's why I'm not on the wall. Yeah. Uh, they, they had maybe the right confession, but not a very good methodology at coming to that. And so whenever we look at this, we, we do have to look at them individually and ask these questions. And we don't need to be scared. You don't need to be scared at ever coming to your faith that seriously where you say, I want to see, come and see. You know, Jesus said, come and see. I want to come and see. I want to come and see on my own. So he's inviting us all to do that. And I guarantee you go through it and the Lord holding your hand, you will come through just fine. And you will not end up like Bart, Bart Ehrman. 